there, everyone. This is Mitch Ashley. And I'm Alan Schimmel. And you're listening to... Security Boulevard Chats, out on the boulevard. Out on the boulevard, yeah. Security. Mm -hmm. We've been doing this podcasting on security a while. Not not Hollywood Boulevard, though. Not Hollywood? Oh, yeah. With Celluloid Heroes. (laughs) No, that's a different song. Different Different song. song. (laughs) Except for Lola. Um, Lola. Oh yeah, L O L A. Okay. Anyway, Mitch, we're back. We I know we we took a good week or two off there as we were both out in Paris. You the week before KubeCon, me the week after KubeCon. So altogether it was a few weeks off. But you know, security stands still for no one. There's of course been a lot going on. You remember how we used to say, um, you know, I took some time off in hiatus because <laughs> yeah. we're on hiatus. <laughs> we, well, yeah. I thought we were in Hyannis, but that's Cape Cod. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> We've said that before, haven't we? <laughs> yeah. I feel like we're doing Borschbelt comedy here, like with Henny Youngman yeah. or something. Take my wife, some please. <laughs> uh, um, anyway, um, so Mitch, you know, we're going to talk about a few things. But one thing I did want to mention is, Like every three-week period, I bet you look at, I don't know if this was a tough three weeks or not, but there were a whole bunch of big breaches that were announced over the last couple of weeks. Absolutely. Um, I remember we were talking about Textron Gang. Um, One of the breaches was getting in the middle of the the payments to doctors with Health health and Human Services. And uh, yeah, that basically was a big coming one. up the entire works for, I don't know if it's the entire industry, but you know, a lot of things were, were stopped dead in their tracks. And what was also interesting to me about that is the hacker that had, had involved in doing this had been present uh, contributing to an open source project over a period of time, kind of about two years developing up trust and becoming yeah. part of the community, whoever this person was a deep, or not. A deep or, plant. Yep, yep, exactly. And uh, a sleeper cell. So yeah. woke up, you know, and uh, suddenly uh, deploying some some malicious code along with uh, the rest of the open source software. And poof, you got a problem. I mean, I, I'd love at some point to see a post from one of that. Was that his intent all along or did something turn? As I think we mentioned on the uh, on the Textron gang, did they break his programming like Dr. U- y- Ue, whatever, Dr. from Dune? Dr. Yui from <laughs> Dune. I, programming. Yeah, I don't know what happened, but yeah, that went wrong quick. But yeah, you know, seeker. <laughs> home, uh, that's right. Uh, home Depot, though, also had a big breach. I think one AT&T. of the banks had a big breach. AT&T oh, had a huge God. breach. There's been, you know, it just, for as much money as we spend and as much as we talk about it, as much resources, sometimes, you know, in security, you, and I get it, right? With my security friends out there, we just feel like like you're shoveling sand against the tide some days, right? It, it is. It's also interesting that you know we're at a time now where two days later, we're not talking about any one of those. Uh, two days after it happened, right? How many times have we talked about AT&T's breach since the first day or so? Yeah. Happening? You know, it just they just kind of roll off. Because they just keep coming and they keep coming. You know what? It's a politician's dream, right? It's a 48-hour cycle, and then, you know, you start fresh again. Yeah. Crazy. The message. Anyway, moving on from that, Mitch, you know, and speaking of all these breaches, so much of it has been focused on software supply chain security. Mm-hmm. And and when we talk software supply chain security, make no mistake, they're talking about open source. Right. So a big part of it. Right. It's a big part of it. These open source components that go into so many of our apps today. And recently, you know, the federal government, well, certainly since Joe Biden's been president, mm-hmm. uh, CISA has put a big magnifying lens on the open source security and not always with a favorable kind of review if you will right mm-hmm. but but recently they the, the folks at CISA came out with uh some new guidance and some new instructions on open source this is an article federal support for open source security and security boulevard there right okay. and uh, they're announcing a new initiative mitch i i know you know a bit about it why don't you kind of fill us in 
Yeah, they held, I think it was a two day invite only summit where they brought leaders from open source community as well as federal folks to talk about what can we do to, how can we put things in place to help us create a more secure environment for open source software development, which in and of itself is a recognition of, we're not getting rid of open source. It may be one of the ways, I mean, open source is an issue because it's so widely used in some cases that if it does get compromised, you know, a lot of things do, right? We have, have several instances of that recently, but it's just a recognition of, we need to do something to help lift up the security of open source teams. So they had, um, they got together. I think they had people from the Rust Foundation. Um, oh, they were also talking to, by the way, uh, Python. They're also talking about some of the, um, rep not just repositories, but also build tools that were part of where you pull down libraries, you know, they call them different things in different environments was a big part of it. Cause that's how some of these things get distributed and the importance of S bombs and, you know, kind of see where this takes off. But they also talked about tabletop expert exercises and why that's important. So if you're on an open source project, that's just as important to do it there as it would be in your own application development. So I, it seemed like a pretty healthy conversation. It would have been interesting to listen in on it. I would enjoy that. Well, yeah, and I'm sure more details of it will be coming out as well. But you know what? Frankly, look, the uh, cooperation of the federal, especially the folks at the good folks at CISA, with the community has, I think, really accelerated. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we see this in the Open SSF, the Open Source Security Foundation, part of Linux Foundation, working a lot on the S bomb software supply chain security issues. Um, we also uh, are, are seeing it. Uh, in the EU too, it's not just CSER. I, I will tell you, it may even be more advanced over in Europe. Mm -hmm. I had a chance at KubeCon to sit down with Brian Fox, who of course is the CTO and one of the co-founders at Sonatype. Mm -hmm. and, but beyond that, Brian is very, very involved in the open very source in. security. Yeah. yeah, and he, you know, he's testified at, at some of these things, and I believe he was at that CISA, uh meetup as well as talking to a lot of the EU folks. I had a chance to sit down with Brian in KubeCon in Paris mm -hmm. and, and talk a little bit about the role government plays here in helping us uh, make open source more secure, or helping us with the S-bombs, uh, helping us with our software supply chain security. And um, there was a time where I'd say, you know, keep the government out of our hair with this that was when mm -hmm. i had hair um but <laughs> I'm from the government i'm here today here to help i'm yeah. here to help right but i think increasingly we're seeing the government as as a necessary partner in this equation they have the ability to make things happen they you know they don't necessarily favor the big guy over the little guy or the little guy over the big guy they're kind of a you know, equalizer there. And, and I think between the U.S. government and what they're doing with CISA and some of the other U.S. You know, office offices, as well as what's going on in the EU, who, you know, seem to have a greater will to get something done than we do. Um, I'm hoping we'll make a dent, we'll make a difference in, in making open source more secure. You know, they're, they're not there to pick winners and losers, right? Like you may have in a competitive environment. There are certain things that government can do better uh, and do well when it comes to bringing mm -hmm. parties together, trying to work on solutions. It doesn't always happen. It doesn't always work out. But I think in the terms of, in terms of security and maybe to some degree software, we'll see hopefully open source software becomes another great example where by bringing contributors together from all factions of who both develop and use open source, we have a better, more secure approach to it. Kind of inform and support projects to do secure development, create the most secure software they can. Agreed. Now we're going to um, play your interview. Are we going yeah, to listen? Yeah, you, that you was know really what? Good. I think this is a good time. Here's, here's yeah. our Brian Fox interview at KubeCon on government and open source software. Hello, everyone. We're back here live in Paris on the show floor of a buzzing, buzzing KubeCon. As I said earlier, they're expecting about 13,000 people wow. this year. This will be the largest KubeCon ever. 
Um, and, I, you know, just looking around the floor, you guys are shooting out. I don't know what people can see because some of it's blurred. But it's a very busy floor. I'm joined here by my friend Brian Fox. If you don't know Brian, uh, CTO at Sonatype. Co-founder? Yeah. Co-founder, right. CTO at Sonatype. I've been interviewing Brian for a long time. For 10 a years? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah. more? Yeah. Um, but beyond his role at Sonatype, Brian's probably one of the most influential community involved folks in especially on the security side of things, right? Uh, Sonatype is I oh you guys a platinum or diamond sponsor, some high sponsor of QCon. But Brian personally, you're involved with OSSF. That's right. FinOps. Finos, we're, we're Finos. involved. Yep, uh, I'm a governing board member of the Open SSF and number number of the committees there as well. So we're going to talk about Sonatype and we're going to talk about CNCF, but let's let's first talk about things like Open SSF and you're you're a board member. I mean, I mean, there's obviously business reasons why you want to be on the board, but Brian, with you, it's it's a passion. As well, Let, yeah. let's talk about. It. I don't mean to embarrass you, <laughs> but let's talk about that. You know, for a bit, what what drives you to be involved like that? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's been since 2011, probably that that uh, those of us at Sonatype have been observing this problem with what everybody talks about now, supply chain security. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've been on a mission for how many years is that? 13, 14 years at this point yep. to try to help large organizations do a better job of managing their open source dependencies from a security and license compliance and architecture risk. Uh, we know that um, doing a good job on this can lead to better outcomes for the company, but also makes them much more efficient. You know, so many people think about it, it's a tax. I have to do this to make things more secure. But we know that that's actually not true, that, that it unlocks productivity, but the market in general has been very resistant to change. It's just human nature. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, the last couple of years we've been involved with others at the Open SSF, working with the US government, with CISA, with ONCD, trying to help really, you know, elevate the message, spread the word, and help work with the regulators. You know, after Solar Winds and Log for Shell, um, a lot of people sat up and paid attention. Unfortunately, not all of that attention was was um, focused in the right area. And so that's what I've been spending a lot of time trying to help shape that policy, help inform the legislators so that we get you know, sensible legislation that helps us all be better, not punitive legislation that can really undo things. Well, I, I remember speaking to you, I guess it was last year. You know, we're here in Paris. And, and so we shouldn't focus on maybe just US regulatory uh, challenges. But the EU yeah. generally is a, a step or two ahead. They, they have more of a, a will, if you will, to do something, but they don't necessarily, and, I, and I, it's not the EU, I think it's all politicians and you know, I'm, here, I'm from the government and I'm here to help kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. um, they, they don't really understand the issues, yes. right? They, they have good intentions. <laughs> But yes. the road to hell is, is lined it's with good intentions. With good intentions. Right. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, it's true that the legislators in, in the EU have moved quickly with the Cyber Resiliency Act, the Product Liability Directives, the AI Act. All of that, I think, generally is good. Many of us spent the last year, 2023, trying to help shape um, and, and, frankly, undo a little bit of what the CRA the, was focused on because it was, it was focused on potentially uh, punishing the open source maintainers, holding them yeah. liable for things that were out of their control. And that just comes down from the misunderstanding of, of the policymakers. Like from, a, from moving the industry forward, trying to hold vendors accountable, I think they were spot on. Right. The problem was you have no leverage over open source maintainers. Outside of your jurisdiction, you can't hold them responsible in the same way. And the danger was potentially that open source could opt out of Europe. It sounds crazy, but people were saying it. People were asking us, for example, at Maven Central, the repo that we run, you know, could you could you potentially stop our stuff from being downloaded inside of the EU? So it was a very serious thing that I think the policymakers didn't understand at first, and it took a lot of effort to kind of course correct that. 
So we're we're within the Open SSF. We have uh, you know we're building further relationships with those folks in Brussels this year to try to help educate that. You know, on the U.S. side, ONCD and CISA have been very involved in the community. We've had many many um, summits. In fact, I was just at one two weeks ago with CISA where they convened all of the package repository folks together and many of the other leaders in, in prominent foundations, Apache, Eclipse, uh, OpenSSF, to talk about the problem, the sustainable funding challenge that we all face, right? So I think on the US side, they're doing a great job of getting informed. Actual regulatory action is slow at the moment. On the EU, it's almost the opposite. And so we need to kind of smooth those things out and I think we'll be in a good shape. Excellent. Good stuff. Good, good. Uh, got a briefing right here from Ryan. Um, Ryan, if you don't mind, let, let's focus, pivot over now to Sonatype sure. specifically. As you mentioned, Sonatype has been the maintainer, maintainers of Maven Central for as long as I, I think it's been a Maven Central, yeah. right? Um, and as such, you, you know, you've been at the forefront of you want to call it DevSecOps, you want to call it now software supply chain security, um, of, of you know this whole movement. What's new? Is there new, right? Because I think part of the issue is you keep fighting that same battle. You keep fighting on the same battlefield. Yeah, yeah. But there's new <clears throat> fronts I think, open. So I think the new thing this year, and it, it's not new to me, really, but it's new to the rest of the market-ish is you know the whole push for S bombs, right? So S bombs, we we it was a means to an end for us 11 years ago when we were trying to help organizations. Most of them didn't know what was in their software. Unfortunately, many of them still don't and are struggling with it. You know, on the U.S. side, they've been pushing the S bomb software bill of materials. If you don't know, um, you know it, it's required for many government sales. The FDA will, won't even begin to look at approval of a new device without an SBOM as yep. of October, I think, right? So, so there's a lot of talk pushing that. You know, the, the legislation in the EU references it as well. So it's, it's a worldwide phenomenon, not just the US. And so, you know, what I've observed in just the last year um, is a major pivot. So about a year ago, I went to some sessions. Everybody was kind of grappling with, why are they making us do this? It's really hard to do this. We don't know how to do this all for reasons that they would never want to tell their customers. Things like, we don't have anybody that knows how to maintain that software. We, we don't track what's in it, right? Things that, that would yeah, consumers would be horrified about. That was the conversation last year. This year, the conversation um, is more focused on, okay, I need to produce S-bombs. I need to ask for S-bombs from my vendors. Um, so they've moved from sort of that denial, anger into acceptance. But I think people are still struggling with, okay, now I have all these S-bombs, what am I supposed to do with it, right? And so that's why yesterday we, we launched um, the Sonatype S-bomb manager, which is a, a version of our platform um, that is focused on people that are procuring software in organizations um, from many different vendors, um, and also trying to have a clearinghouse to be able to provide their S-bombs, both from their first party software, but also from their third-party stack downstream stuff, to right. their their uh, customers as well, sure. right? So there's a number of new workflows and use cases that, that are, are coming into play. And it's interesting because the scale of this is much larger than even we expected. You know, we're, we're used to organizations managing, you know, tens of thousands of applications, which is a, is a lot, it. but the biggest organizations, 10,000, 20,000 is fairly normal. We've had those same organizations talk to us about a need to manage millions of S bombs, uh, which is which, which is quite shocking. Which brings up the point <laughs> I wanted to make to you. It all sounds copacetic, right? What a great idea! We need to do this. I just want to let this go. I'm not sure if this gets picked up in our mics, but that's loud. But the, the, sometimes the devil's in the details, and and. You know, what I saw I, is coming out of RSA last year, it'll be interesting to see what I see at RSA this year, is sort of a tower of Babel of S-bombs, right? So, yeah. compatibility of S-bomb formats. Because if Sonatype has their format and Company Z has their format and Company X has their format 
and we, this reminds me, we remember when RSS feeds first came out. Yeah. There was right. RSS 1.0 and 2.0 <clears throat> and yeah. Atom and, and all these different formats. And so if you had an RSS feeder, if you weren't able to read all the sure. different RSS formats, you needed yeah. six different readers. Yeah. Uh, until a company called FeedBurner, if you remember, FeedBurner normalized that's right. the RSS feeds. Do we have anything that's going to normalize the S-bombs? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a use case of, of our tool. Um, but the, there's really two main standards for S-bombs. It's SPDX, which is a Linux Foundation uh, project, and then Cyclone DX, uh, which is uh, an OWASP project. You know, we've been involved with right. Cyclone since the 1.0. Sonatype contributed the first security profile extension for it, for example. Um, because specifically, I didn't want to invent our own bespoke right. um, uh, Because that protocol. doesn't help the cause. That's right, it doesn't help the cause. And so there's really just those two main, and I think you know, everybody has uh, come to accept that at this point, and pretty much I think all the tools are both able to consume and emit uh, the different S-bomb formats. Uh, so it's a little bit of extra work, but it, you know, it's, it, it's sort of a solved problem at the moment for people. So I don't think you need to get too worried about that. I don't see any other standards coming along anytime soon. Uh, you know, we're, we're well past not. that. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I'm, that, that's, that's good news. Um, look, we've gone almost this whole interview. We haven't mentioned AI. Hey, uh, I was wondering when you were going to ask. I have to. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. I, I say AI, we get like money or something. <laughs> I don't right. know. Um, what, what role is AI going to have on S-bombs and so forth? Oh, you know, it's interesting. You know, the, the, the conversation around S-bombs has sort of, uh, you know, uh, fragmented in a, in a sense, and people are talking about crypto bombs, cloud bombs, AI bombs, right? Because you need to be able to potentially document and disclose what models, what the training set went into the models, right? So I think the bill of materials concept is here to stay, and there's going to be many different extensions Flavors, for different yep. areas. Um, you know, we've interestingly we've seen many of our uh, customers asking us to help them manage the AI usage within their products. So, and, and from my perspective, it looks very much like 10, 15 years ago in open source, where we would talk to policymakers and they would say, "We have a policy against it. We're not using it." And then you go and look at what's in their applications or talk to the developers, and it's open oh, source is everywhere. everywhere. Well, the same exact thing is happening with AI and LLMs right now. So yes. about a month or so ago, we added some new capabilities to help detect uh, and recognize LLM, AI components, AI REST calls, and be able to surface those so that then the governance engine we have in our platform can help uh, the policy folks in charge there. kind of reason about right. it. So, so AI uh, you know, is, is getting into the applications in a fairly large way that many people don't realize. You know, I think the, the AI aspects of the whole industry will certainly help. Uh, the generative AI parts can help um, you know, with some of the S-bombs, you know, filling out descriptions that are rational. It's really good at those things. You know, if you have yeah. a component but you're not sure what the category is or what, how to describe it in the S-bomb, uh, you, you can use AI techniques to be able to to help massage some of those things. Same thing in terms of trying to interpret it. So I think it's going to be, you know, secretly underneath the hood in both the generative, you know, the, the export and the import of these different formats as as we're sort of, you know, hanging around the periphery of the formats and, and what the humans can do. Love it. Brian, we're about out of time. Sonatype.com, of course, is the website for Sonatype. Sonatype.com, that's right. Where are any other kind of websites you want to put in people's minds regarding, so well, the OpenSSF. The OpenSSF.org, yeah, yep. yeah. I mean, we, we, we didn't touch on the, the state of the software supply chain report. That's an enduring one. Um, When's that coming? In October. This year is the 10th year. That's right. It's going to be huge. And, you know, a lot of the research that we've done over the last 10 years is still completely relevant. Uh, you know, we tend to take a different look at the industry every year. Um, so we're going to be going back and looking at a lot of those key findings and trying to update them Trends. and summarize them. Um, you know, so the team's already hard at work on that, Very um, cool. trying to trying to get that updated. You can look at all of the the past nine years of reports at sonatype.com slash sscr. Uh, so yeah. we'll see you at, at RSA. That's right. We'll see you at the open source summit coming up. 
I want to say June in Seattle, is it? Or April in, in Seattle? Uh, there's one in June. There's also one in a couple of weeks, uh, April in Seattle. In Seattle. I yeah. think we're going to be... Uh, That's right. What are we doing here? I'm going to be everywhere. I'm going to Dev Nexus. I'm going to uh, VolneCon. Yeah, Nexus. no, you were telling me. You're yeah. crazy. I, yeah. You know, God yeah. bless you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I pick my spots. That's but right. But anyway, Brian, thanks for all yeah, you do for, for the whole community us. and continued success with Sonatype. Thank you. You know, Mitchell, I've known Brian for a bunch of years now. And, and mm -hmm. what's funny is I wind up talking to him about non-Sonatype stuff more than I talk to him about Sonatype, to tell you the <laughs> truth. But he is he's really passionate. He's a real advocate for open source security. And a, he is. You know, he's made so many man. contributions, you know, directly and yep. also through the organizations that he's a part of. So good this, stuff uh, there. One of the good ones, definitely. A great the next by thing. The way. Yep. Thank you. And again, all of our interviews from KubeCon are up at TechStrong TV. You did quite a bunch. I did some. Mike Fazar did some. And uh, highly, highly recommend going to check them out. Mitch, I want to turn our focus, if you will, to RSA. Um, Just around I, the corner. I announced, yep. I announced something uh, a couple of days ago. You know, we started the Security Bloggers Network and then the Security Bloggers Meetup. I guess it was 2004 or 2005, so yeah. 20 years uh, ago. Four. Yeah. And for many, many years, it was the best party for us and people like us at was, RSA, right? It was Wednesday the peak night. of the week. Peak of the week. Yep, Wednesday night, chill out, have a nice drink, Meet with marketing friends. free zone. Mm -hmm. The last couple of years with COVID, it was harder and finding a venue to do it. And our good friend, Anthony Freed, you know, where whichever company he was with, he tried to made it available to a space, mm -hmm. but it was different. We were kind of sharing it and all of that. So this year we, we announced the, uh, meetup is going to be at the Tonga room, like Tonga con, right. which isn't happening this year. So we're going to try to incorporate some of the Tonga con stuff too. Uh, but again, it's Wednesday night it, and, uh, there is an Eve, uh, an Evite, not Evite, an Eventbrite page where you can register for the party. You must mm -hmm. register. You can't just walk in. It's not that it costs money or anything, but we need to keep a control on things. Um, but along with that, though, we've changed the name of the Security Bloggers Network to the Security Creators Network. Interesting. Yep. And you know what, Mitchell? I'll give credit. This was Rich Mogul's idea a couple of years ago. Really? I didn't realize that came from him. Yeah, it came from Rich. Um what was interesting is we saw um, people don't blog like they did in 2003 and four and five. Right. It's right? also become but, more corporate and a lot of other things too. It's well, the, the security bloggers now is 350 plus blogs. A lot of them are corporate. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, just because they don't necessarily blog doesn't mean we don't create security themed content. There's more security right. content than ever. Whether it's in podcasts or videos or TikToks or or Twitter or you know people working for security companies who create ebooks and white papers and position papers and people who write about security, whether it's from our friends at Cyber Risk Alliance or Tech Target, you know Kelly and her team at Dark Reading, and and here at Security Boulevard and the Bloggers Network and everything. So, and the other driving thing there, Mitchell was. Increasingly over the last couple of years, especially with COVID, we have our core group of, of folks that we've been doing this party with all these years, mm -hmm. and it's great seeing them. It but is. I feel like raising a glass and saying, here's to us and those like us, damn few left. Yeah. Another one you lost in the war. <laughs> Where Where's Joe? Yeah, well, no, some <laughs> of them have retired and they don't yeah. do RSA anymore. Mm -hmm. Others, unfortunately, are not here anymore. Yeah. Very right. True. We just, I think yesterday was, uh, well, by the time this reads last week, by the time this plays was a one, I think the one year anniversary, maybe it's two years of, of Mike Murray, Mike Murray, yeah. you know, passing away. And, and that was a kind of hole in the heart. Mike was mm -hmm. a great guy and I still don't understand the whole thing, but no. anyway, we've lost a lot of really good people. Mm-hmm. At the same time, the security community has grown so much, and it's time for fresh blood. A lot so of great people have come along, for sure. Yeah, no, and 
you know, so I reached out to the folks at the security, cybersecurity marketing society, not because I want marketing at the security creators network. I really mm -hmm. don't. I've spoken to Jennifer Leggio on this and, you know, she was, she wanted to make sure we kept our principles, which is, this is a no marketing zone. Right. And I, I almost really, I wasn't sure what to do because it is the cybersecurity marketing mm -hmm. society, but Gianna and the team there understand that this is a no marketing zone. This isn't about marketing, right. but we need Mitchell. We need fresh blood running this event. We need fresh blood in the security creators network. We need to embrace the change that's going on. Mm -hmm. I'm not opening membership to AIs. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. They have their own society, I guess. Thank you, right. <laughs> um, but that being said, I do want to open the books to folks who are creating content around security. They're welcome here. We want to have you here, and we want you to come down and, and party. So say a little bit more um, about so if you're someone who's doing this, creating content like this, or doing, you know, because these are the kind of folks we want to draw in, how would you describe that? Well, I think they are contributors to cybersecurity sites. I mentioned a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. I think they are people who podcast or vidcast or whatever it's called. Uh, people who do go on TikTok and Twitter or X or YouTube, or YouTube. YouTube Shorts, yeah. or they just create security content as part of their everyday job. They're writing product marketing and marketing material, perhaps, for the cybersecurity you know, market. If you create security content or security-themed content, you're welcome. Thinking about giving presentations that conferences right you're pulling together speakers content. at conferences for speakers. sure for sure for sure for sure with people right you don't have to yep. be a educators person yep you don't have to be a product person you're creating security related content but again no marketing zone no sales we're here to talk cyber catch up form friendships form networking support each other and, and that's what this is about mm -hmm. Great. So uh, continue to build community, right? That's yep, what and I, en I encourage, I encourage anyone listening to this who's at RSA who fits that, go register for this. We'll try to put the Eventbrite uh, address in in the notes. Um, also, we we need sponsors for this, right? It mm -hmm. this little hullabaloo will wind up costing every bit of twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah, we need four or five sponsors to help defray the cost there. So if you're listening to this and your company can sponsor, we'd love to have you. And again, it is a marketing-free zone, but we'll we'll give you a chance to say hello. We'll have There's your banners will. there. No, people appreciate it. Yep. There's it. a lot of goodwill in this. And it, and it's a uh, look, just from our core group, it's a pretty who's who of security. So mm -hmm. really excited with that. Well, good. Really, Fantastic. really excited. If people don't you know, know about that, this. Security Bloggers Network, you can find that on Security Boulevard, which became the home kind of for it. So I would imagine Five years the Security ago. Creators Network is going to continue. Well, I think we've already type. changed the name over. Oh, we did. Okay, great. Yes, we changed the name and the branding nice. over to Creators Network. Okay. Um, but staying on RSA for a second, Mitch, just a reminder that Monday of RSA week, you and Mark Miller will be hosting mm -hmm. our eighth or ninth annual DevOps Connect DevSecOps event. As I mentioned earlier, uh, David Brin will be keynoting it, but we have an all-star lineup of, of speakers there, and you're doing a panel mm -hmm. with some uh, leadership. AI and DevOps and, and DevSecOps. Dev we have people, we have security leaders from Google, OpenAI, Microsoft. Uh, who Anthropic. Else? We Anthropic. We have Anthropic. Exactly. We, we have DeepMinds, which is, I guess, part of Google, Google. and a bunch more. You sure. can go check it out on the RSA site. Or I think if you go to Tech Strong Events, we probably have a, a lead in page for it there as well. And not just um, the guy. There's a lot of innovators that are that are speaking there. So I think folks will yep. get a lot out of it. By the way, we'll also be doing uh, we'll be live at Broadcast Alley all week, streaming live mm -hmm. interviews there. You can check us out, come by and say hello. 
I'm excited for RSA this year, Mitch. Moscone West. Yeah, it's. Yep. I, I kind of get the feeling. Last year was a lot better as things were coming back. Oh, I kind of yeah. feel like this is going to be the baby we're back kind of at RSA. Well, I, you yeah. know, I spoke to Cecilia, who, uh, Mar Marigny, who runs the sandbox programs, mm -hmm. the innovation programs. And she wouldn't commit to a number, but she said they're very, very happy with registrations. Okay. At this point. I'm not going to say so, that if it isn't up there. Yeah, we'll we'll see yeah, how well. it goes. Anyway, there's a long security boulevard yeah. today, Mitch, with the yeah. interview and everything, but I think it was a good one. It was a fantastic one, and uh, we appreciate people hanging with us while we were hanging out in hi hiatus for a few weeks there and coming back on and getting on the podcast with you all. So we appreciate you listening. Be sure and check out our other Textron uh, podcast that we have. We have everything from AI and DevOps and a number of great topics. So you can go to uh, techstrongpodcast.com and tell your friends about Security Boulevard. A lot of folks have listened to us over the years and we appreciate everybody hanging with us and yeah. being a part of this conversation. So with that, should we wrap it up? Wrap it up, Mitch. This has been Mitch Ashley and Alan Schimmel. And you've been listening to another security chat on the boulevard security boulevard chats there we go take care everybody